Welcome to the Aviation Sales and Marketing Executive Brief, and today we're talking about qualifying prospects. And this is a uh, very important activity in phase two of the marketing system. So I'm Paula Williams. And I'm John Williams. And we are... ABCI. And ABCI's mission is... Help you guys sell products and services in the aviation industry. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about qualifying, um, what that means is that there is a very small group of people who is actually um, in the market for your product or service, and everybody else is either not in the market, not interested, not in the right demographic, not whatever. Or um, in the market and can't afford it and they know it. Exactly. <laughs> so we'll talk about reasons for disqualifying people, and we'll talk about ways to disqualify people. And what that does is it pairs down your list to the people who are the most um, deserving of your time and attention as a sales or marketing person. So um, when you go to an air race or any other kind of race, they often have what they call qualifying gates, which are um, points at which you have to have acquired so many points or have um, achieved a certain speed or you know whatever the qualifying criteria are um, by the time you get to that point. So some of these uh, qualifying gates that we can use in the sales and marketing pro process are specific targeting. Um, you know, so when we're looking for a list of people to send a postcard to, we might look for people who are within a certain state and hold a certain license and um, maybe own a certain aircraft, you know, whatever those, those targeting factors are. Um, we can do research uh, on specific people using the internet or you know any other resources or association uh, profiles and other things, social media, lots of different things like that. And we can ask them questions um, either in person, you know, have a person ask them questions um, as part of the, the sales process or part of the discovery process. Um, or we can have our software ask them questions like, would you like a buyer's guide for this particular widget? Or, um, you know, do you um, own an aircraft, do you have, you know, whatever questions we want to ask in the process of, of our um, automated marketing steps. So a qualified prospect has three things, um, interest, resources, and authority. Now, if a person has no interest, that's pretty obvious, right? We don't spend much time um, on that because it's pretty self-evident, but the other two um, items are pretty, it can sometimes be hard to, to tell. So somebody may have a lot of interest, but may not have the resources to buy our product or service. And those are a little bit harder to come by because we don't want to ask people in our first meeting, you know, so how much money do you have? Exactly. <laughs> that just isn't done in our society. So, um, you know, there are some ways that we can do that and determine if they have the resources to be a qualified prospect for our product or service. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is authority. Um, if somebody doesn't have the authority to make a purchase decision, then we're wasting our time um, with them and we either need to move up the chain, the org chart, um, to a person that does have the authority or um, we need to disqualify this, this person altogether as a, as a prospect. So we, we have two ways of, of working with that one. Very easy to make this mistake and end up talking your heart out to a guy that can't authorize the purchase. Exactly. And what we don't want to have happen is to spend a lot of time and money um, going to visit people, especially, you know, if you have travel um, and, you know, giving sales presentations, um, sending information packages over and over again, um, you know, spending a lot of time on the phone with people who are not qualified um, because that is time and money that could be much better spent uh, in, on other people in your sales process. All right, so this should look familiar to you by now. Um, this is our marketing process. Phase one is advertising and prospecting, of course. Phase two, building credibility and closing sales. And phase three, referrals, resells, and recaptures. Um, Qualifying prospects falls mostly in phase two, but you know it does have some aspects in phase one, so we'll talk about that briefly um, in phase one and phase two. So starting with phase one, um, a couple of ways that you can qualify uh, 
prospects is, first of all, by attracting the right ones. Um, when you do your search engine optimization, you want to pick words that are the most likely to be used by the people who are the most qualified for your product or service. And this is a, a time in marketing, one of the few times when using jargon may work to your advantage. Because if there are specific words that people in your target demographic use that nobody else does, um, you know, optimizing a page or, or your whole site for those words can sometimes be a good strategy. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about, uh, the other example I want to give in, in phase one is like your prospecting postcards. Um, if you were putting together a list, a mailing list of people who may be interested in your product or service, you can use those factors. You know, what is the most likely person to be qualified for my product or service? And you could pare down your list by job title and say only people who are general managers or owners or um, certain job titles would um, be people that you're going to spend printing and postage money on uh, with those postcards. All right, um, the next thing is you want to have bait, and we had talked about calls to action earlier, so we're not going to go into that in great detail, other than the fact that that helps you qualify the right people. If you have a buyer's guide for um, a serious accessory, um, you know, then nobody is likely to download that buyer's guide except for serious owners. Um, you know, so that's something that uh, you can actually kind of by the title of that downloadable ebook or that uh, that buyer's guide or that video or whatever it is that you're using as your call to action. You can also help people kind of self identify themselves as qualified or not. Um, now, not everybody is going to be in your VIP, absolutely most fabulously qualified category, and you don't want to dismiss people too soon. So here you can have kind of a, a split in your marketing system and have a tier one and a tier two prospects, you know, and say this person qualifies for a tier one, we're going to send them an information package. Uh, but we don't want to ignore everyone else uh, because they either may become qualified or may know someone who is. So we're going to send them a postcard anyway, and we're going to spend a lot less money, um, but we're still going to keep them in our pipeline. So that's another way that we can um, manage that, that qualification process in our phase one. Last thing is in our initial call or our initial, you know, when we introduce ourselves and say, you know, did you... Did you, were you able to download the ebook? Did it answer all your questions? You know, those kinds of things. We can often get a feel for, is this person someone who's really in the market or is this someone who is just maybe doing a research paper for their um, Embry-Riddle assignment um, on aeronautics or something like that? Um, and we don't want to upset those people, but we also don't want to spend any more time and resources on them. So in that initial sales call, you can get a pretty good feel for, is this person um, still a good prospect. Disqualify them if they're not. Um, you can still send them emails every once in a while, but you don't want to spend a lot of resources on uh, marketing activities. No is a valid response to a sales call. Exactly. Absolutely. Or you may find out, you know, no, I'm not really interested in your product at this time. I just had a question um, for some other reason, and that's perfectly fine as well. So moving on to, to phase two, um, some of the things that we can do in our regular emails, we might have a, um, a clickable link in our, our emails and we can tell if people have clicked on that. If we're using a good CRM system like Infusionsoft, we can turn on um, a feature that we call least lead scoring. And what that does is it assigns a certain amount of points for every one of our emails that they open um, and every one of our links that they click. Um, and so on, so that we can kind of get a feel for how interested is this person. Um, so that handles that first first qualification, how interested are they? And if someone is really high on that list and is scoring a lot of points and is opening every single email and clicking on every single link, they may justify more time and effort on your part than somebody that never you know, opens an email. Um, another thing we can do is in social media. Um, whenever someone downloads one of our or takes certain calls to action in our, um, our sales process, I connect with them on LinkedIn. Um, and what that does is two things. One, it lets them know that I'm interested in them. And two, it gives me a lot of information. 
uh, about what they do, where they worked in the past, um, you know, what their position is, who else they work with that I know, and so on. And we're going to talk about that some more in some later videos. But uh, um, that social media connection uh, in a lot of ways can, can do some good things. And again, we can make decisions about these other um, items as we go forward. So, you know, we may decide that a formal sales presentation is warranted or not warranted based on how well this person has qualified themselves or disqualified themselves. Um, we've early in our company's existence, we went to California, two states away, to visit with someone who we found out later was not qualified. Um, that is not a mistake we intend to make again. Um, so those formal sales presentations um, and other things can can sometimes be really, really expensive and it's not something that we want to do lightly. Um, but you can also spend a lot of time on those follow up sales calls. Uh, you know, often people will say, call me back next week and let's talk about this. Here's a bunch of information that I need. Um, can you spend a couple of hours doing research and call us back? You know, you can really waste a lot of time on someone that is, is not qualified. On the other hand, they may ask to call you back in four weeks mm -hmm. because they're in the middle of an acquisition exactly. or some other thing that is validated. And they told you that up front. Right. So if you have already qualified them, you know, obviously you're going to want to um, commit to spending the time doing the research, providing them with the information that they need. All right. So there's some some other ways that you can um, use your phase two to validate those kinds of things. So we talked about our follow up sales calls. All right, so we know how this fits into the, the vast scheme of things. Um, and mostly it's in phase two is where we spend the most time qualifying um, customers because we assume if they've made it to phase two, they have an interest, but they may not have the resources or authority. So um, those are the ways that we can kind of go through that process, ask them questions um, and, and make that happen. So here are some specific things that we can look for if we drill down a little bit further in those conversations, um, in those forms that we ask them to fill out, um, in those links we ask them to click, um, things like job title. Um, now, job title can be deceptive, right, John? Exactly. Somebody who may be a, a president and CEO may be the president and CEO of a very small company, um, and vice versa, someone who is a, a project manager at Boeing, you know, is going to be a much more qualified person than, than someone who may be a president and CEO of a very, uh, very small company. Um, and also job titles evolve over time. Uh, social media research, you can use that to, to discover, you know, where have they worked in the past? What qualifications do they have? Where did they go to school? Um, you know, a lot of things like that to kind of give you an idea of where do they sit in an org chart? Um, you know, who else are they connected to that you may know or, or not know? Um, and other things. So you can use that as, as the grapevine of asking around about people. You can ask some indirect questions, like when you're preparing some information, if they've requested something from you, you can say, how many information packages do you need? Um, we like to include one for everyone involved in the purchase discussion. And they'll often volunteer, well, let's see, it's going to be me and my boss is going to need to approve the transaction. And some guy from engineering is going to need to look over the, the technical specs and and so on. So that question can lead to a lot of insight about how their organization is structured and uh, who all is involved in that purchase decision. And yet it's not terribly rude <laughs> um, if you ask it at the right time and in the right way. Um, and you can ask them directly, who's going to be involved in this this purchase decision? And this is after you've developed a little bit more rapport with them they understand you're wanting to save them and you time, um, you know, and get down to to the brass tacks. So if you feel that that's the way the conversation is going, you can just up and and ask them, um, you know, who else is going to be involved in this this purchase decision? Who else should be um, in the room for this presentation? Um, you know, and you might even ask. And this is not one that that I feel comfortable with, but we have had some clients do this very successfully. You know, what are some of the reasons that you might decide not to buy today? And they might tell you we don't get new money until the first of the year, um, you know, and it's February. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, in that case, you may get some some good information. And those direct questions, I would say, are for people who are a little bit more experienced, a little bit more skillful, and a little bit farther down the road in the sales presentation when you have a, a good comfort level with the prospect. And, you know, they're not going to be upset about it. You're still going to be friends, even if you disqualify them as a prospect. Um, that doesn't mean that you're going to quit sending them cards and letters and and not shake their hand and buy them coffee when you see them at a trade show. So that's pretty much it for this one. Um, you know, we just wanted to, to give you a real quick overview of qualifications because it is a very important topic and can be very expensive if you do it wrong. Um, other phase two videos will be selling to large organizations and infiltrating the corporate structure, um, interactive sales presentations, and uh, we're looking forward next week to a great panel discussion um, about an educational approach to sales, and that will be Brad Harris of Dallas Jet International and Dave Santo of Aerostar Training Services, and that's going to be fantastic. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. We're really glad that you were able to spend a few minutes with us today. See you guys next time. <laughs>